please turn with me in the scripture to the book of Lamentations, Old Testament book of Lamentations, chapter uh, number three, please. This is the first Sunday of the year of the King, 2018. The very calendar announces that it is the year of the Lord. It is an acknowledgement that the King has entered the world, that he has established heaven as his throne and the earth as his footstool. I always love the fact that uh, those in, in, uh, in secular history will try to define this era as the common era. Uh, but what made it the common era was that the king came into the world. We have before the common era now and common era. When I was growing up, it was B.C., before Christ, and A.D., the year of the king. Uh, because in, uh, in, if you lived in, let's say, 122 B.C., how would you know it was 122 B.C.? How would you know it was 122 years before Christ? You wouldn't. The markers of that calendar were based upon whoever was ruling at that time. That's why when Isaiah says in the sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah, in the year that King Uzziah died, he was making a distinction. He was telling people the year it was, because it was the year of the king. It was based upon who was king and, and, and how many years that that king had ruled. So this is the year 2018, the year of the king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we enter this year, we are to look at it in the context of beginnings, in the context of new beginnings. The first Sunday of a new year has always been a marker for me personally, especially since I entered the pastorate over 36 years ago. I know I don't look that old, but, but, but trust me, yeah, I do. <laughs> The markers of the new year, uh, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, the first Sunday, remind us that life is ever-changing and yet God is ever-consistent. We even pause at a specific moment to say that the old is gone and that the new has come. Some watch a giant ball cascade down in Times Square in New York. Others observe fireworks over the Bay Bridge out here. Uh, or, or in, in, in uh, Australia, maybe the Sydney Opera House, or other landmarks around the world. Regardless, there is a passing from yesterday to tomorrow, a passing from the old to the new, a passing from the last to that which is yet to come. Even in the account of creation, in the book of Genesis, it tells us, in Genesis 1.14, that God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. So the singular constant in life, life as you and I know it, is change. And this truth is so important for us to understand that God even built markers into creation itself. The universe constantly marks change. Whether 2017 was a good year for you or a bad one for you, whether it was a good year for your family or a bad one for your family, whether it was a good year for our nation or a bad one for our nation, 2017 is over. It's over. It's never coming back. You may wish it did, you may wish it doesn't. It isn't. 2017 never will be again. It's gone and once again, we are reminded that the singular constant in creation is change. Only the creator is changeless. And I've shared this with you previously, but I want to reiterate a point. Change can be cataclysmic or it can be cathartic. Change can be that which is done to me and imposes itself upon me. Cataclysmic. Or it can be cathartic, that which I resolve and resign myself to internally. And I say, I will change. I will be different. Whether it is cataclysmic or cathartic, most of the time, not necessarily all the time, but the majority of the time, 
You and I, though we cannot control the circumstances surrounding us always, we can determine how we will deal with things. We can determine how we will deal with change. We can determine how we will deal with, with things we like and things we don't like. We can do that. The book of Lamentations is written by the prophet Jeremiah. And the prophet sought to bring about changes within the hearts of his fellow countrymen. You read his book, the book of Jeremiah. You see that he's the weeping prophet, seeking to bring change, seeking to bring catharsis, seeking to change the hearts of, of, of his fellow countrymen. They refused. And so cataclysm rather than catharsis took place. And the cataclysm was the form of the Babylonian army. This cataclysm brought about the destruction of the temple. It brought about the desolation of Israel. It brought about destruction on an unparalleled and unprecedented uh, 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 scale as far as the people of Israel were concerned. And as Jeremiah walked through the rubble, and as he walked through the devastation resulting from this cataclysm, resulting from this change, resulting from the fact that the people would not change internally, therefore external forces were allowed to bring it about. That's a message. Let me deviate from the notes for a moment. We love scriptures that talk about change. Because we always think of it for somebody else. Why, well, boy, and, and we, you know, I really wish John would get this message. Or I really wish Jill would get this message, or whoever. But the fact is, if you'll recall, the stone the builders rejected became the capstone. Those who fall on it are broken, but those on whom it falls are crushed. It is better to be broken than to be crushed. But one way or another, change is coming. You can, by your own choice, catharsis, you can, by your own choice, come to a moment when you will fall upon the rock of Christ and say, Lord, break me and mold me and use me. Whatever that looks like. Because here's the one thing you know it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like today. It doesn't look like you are today. You can do that. And God will respond to your humility. And do it in a way that is beautiful, even, even painful, but beautiful. Or, or... You can refuse, 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 refuse. And the Lord loves you too much to leave you where you are. And if you will not be broken, then you will be crushed. Because God can take dust and form a new man. That's a word of the Lord for somebody. No excuses about these things. God will form the image of Christ in you, in me, in us, collectively, corporately, and individually. And in that process, he looks to you and he says, will you let me do this? Will you allow yourself to be broken? Because if you will not, then God loves you too much to leave you where you are. And he will allow the external forces to bring about the change that, need, that is needed and is necessary. Jeremiah is walking through the devastation of his country that did not have to happen necessarily, but the stubborn refusal of the people brought about the, the cataclysm of the Babylonian army. And he's walking through that, and he's seeing that, and he's, and he's, and he's, and he's lamenting. He's in anguish. He's in sorrow. It's devastating. The only thing that I personally have a reference to in this, and I'm not talking about the personal loss that all of us feel at times when we lose someone we love, but we're talking about devastation on a mass scale. One month after the September 11th attacks, October of 2001, I was asked to preach in New York. I took my entire family at the time because I wanted my children to see. 
I wanted them to know. I wanted them to understand. And as I, as I was preaching there, we obviously had some time together, so we walked down to ground zero, and the place was still smoldering. The stench was still strong. You could smell it on the Brooklyn Bridge coming into lower Manhattan still smoldering and steaming, and, and the rubble was still there. And it was devastation unlike anything I'd ever seen. And New Yorkers, strong, tough New Yorkers, they pride themselves on that. I watched as strong, tough New Yorkers walking in that area would turn their head because they couldn't look at it, because it was so painful a sight. I watched as people covered their mouth. This is a month later, still in tears as they walked past that area. Devastation, lamenting. This is what Jeremiah is doing. His nation has been devastated. His life has been devastated. His people have been devastated. And a foreign country has not just come and attacked and been removed. They have come, attacked, and taken over and are removing the best and the brightest of which Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were part of that group. This is the context in which we pick up Lamentations chapter number three. It is here that Jeremiah says in verse number 19, I remember my affliction my wandering, the bitterness, and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Have you ever felt that way? Verse 21. Yet, everybody say that word with me. Yet. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. Hallelujah. Father, again, we thank you for your word. Grant, please, insight, revelation, and understanding, I ask in Jesus' precious name. And all those who agreed said together, amen and amen. Yet this I call to mind. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. You know, it's one thing to sing, and I love the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. It is one thing to sing, great is thy faithfulness on a Sunday morning. It's one thing to have the choir in the cathedral with the orchestra and the musicians and we're all standing there and, and the feeling is triumphant. Great is thy faithfulness. That's nice. That's beautiful. That's celebratory. That's lovely. It's quite another thing when you're surrounded by rubble and you're surrounded by death and you're surrounded by stench, and you're surrounded by hopelessness, and you're surrounded by despair, and you're surrounded by everything that looks bad, negative, oppressive, and horrible, and then to stand in the middle of that and say, great is thy faithfulness. You see, that's the difference between being a person who believes some things and a person for whom their belief is their life. This I call to mind. The prophet did not just stumble upon a thought or consider a quaint saying. With intentionality, he looked at the rubble of life, he looked at the rubble of his countrymen, he looked at the devastation that was around him, and with intentionality, he called to mind the goodness of the Lord. 
The tendency in that moment is to blame the Lord. The tendency in that moment is to curse the Lord. The tendency in that moment is to say, well, why if the Lord is loved, did this, was this allowed to happen? Jeremiah looked at it and saw something different. He saw even in the midst of devastation, the hand of mercy and the hand of grace because he saw God in a way that was deeper than just simply the, 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 the caretaking of life being okay. Tozer said this, God has not called you to be happy. He called you to be holy. I'll say that again. God did not call you to be happy. He called you to be holy. And if you'll find holiness, you'll find happiness. That's the irony. If you find what it is to walk in the righteousness of God, you'll find what it is to walk in the wholeness of life. If you find what it is to walk in the shalom of God, then you'll find what it is to walk in the wholeness of God throughout your life, regardless of what is happening to you. But it starts with intentionality. He saw that change had taken place. And not only would his life never be the same, neither would his countrymen. For the Lord had told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29 that 70 years was, was, was what had been appointed. This was not a moment. This was a change for 70 years. For two generations at least, we're going to see this change. And his words of faithfulness would inspire Daniel later. But that's another sermon. In this moment, he made it a Sabbath. He took time to pause and look at life in the context of an almighty God. I firmly believe that every new year, particularly as we begin a new year, we should always approach it as a type of Sabbath. Not necessarily with the idea of rest, because I don't know about you, but it seems like no one rests around the holidays. But with the idea of pausing, and thoughtfully, with intentionality, calling to mind the truths of God. More than simply a day of rest, or even a day of consecrated worship, the Sabbath was a marker. It ended one thing, a week, a season, a year, and it began something new, a new week, a new season, a new year, a new series of years. So I want to encourage you today. Let's look at this like a Sabbath. And the first thing about the Sabbath that I want us to look at is that this is a time for reflecting. This is a time for reflecting. This is a time for intentionally calling to mind the goodness of the Lord. Reflection is more than just remembering. It is to consider the events of one's life and search for God in the midst of them. You know, one of the, one of the great ways that, that you and I can learn to, the, the, the interaction of God in our life is to practice the beauty and to practice the art of reflection. Now, here's what I mean by that. Right in the middle of things, sometimes it's hard to see God, isn't it? But then as you get down the road just a little ways and you stop and you go, hold on one second, and you look back, you can suddenly see how the hand of God preserved you, how the hand of God directed you, how the hand of God guided you, how the hand of God upheld you. At the moment and at the time, you didn't feel, see, or hear any of those things. But when you get back here and you look, you go, oh, now I can see the wisdom of God in this. Now I can see how this was, was God's will, or I can see how, how God was gracious in doing that. This is the beauty and the art of reflection. It's not living in the past, because that's devastating of its own accord, but it's considering it. It's stopping and saying, you know what? I see the hand of, law, of the Lord in my life. Therefore, once you start to learn how he interacted with you here, maybe you'll be more cognizant of how he's interacting with you right now. If you could see what he did then, maybe you can begin to recognize what he's doing 
Now, you see, it is important to consider the events of one's life, both in the positive circumstances, but frankly, especially in the negative ones. Now, listen to me carefully on this, beloved, because I don't want you to get off. I don't want you to get mentally off on this. Okay? <laughs> remembering trauma, remembering abuse, remembering pain, without reflecting upon the promise and the sufficiency of the grace of God to overcome that trauma, abuse, and pain within each circumstance, if you don't bring with the negative the promise, if you don't merge those things together, if you don't wed those things together, what happens to you is you will produce deep-seated bitterness and cynicism within your own life. It produces a desperate hopelessness within your soul that is more wearisome than the punishment of a thousand tormentors. Yet the Bible is not a book of denial. The Bible is not a book of pretense or pretending. The Bible is not a book of mind over matter. It calls us to be honest about our suffering. It calls us to be honest about our difficulties. It calls us to be honest about our circumstances. But, in, but, but, but it's not just the negative of the circumstance. Jesus talked about Lazarus and he said plainly he's dead. But I'm going to go wake him. That's the way you look at circumstances. We have a bill. We have a problem. We have a situation. We have this. Let's evaluate it. Let's look at it. Let's, let's try to figure it out. But let's also understand that the Lord has a remedy. The Lord has a resolution. The Lord has a solution that I have not even yet thought of. Not denial. Not denial of pain, not denial of sickness, not denial of anything, but a, re but a resolute understanding that in the midst of all of these things, God is able. God is able. Look in our text, Jeremiah verse 19. I remember my affliction. I remember my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I remember that. I will remember them. My soul is downcast. There's not denial. There's no denial there. Message translation reads it this way. I'll never forget the trouble, the utter lostness, the taste of ashes, the poison I've swallowed. I remember it all. Oh, how well I remember the feeling of hitting bottom. You ever been there? Three of you. Anybody else ever been there? <laughs> All right, just checking. Okay. I thought, you know, I need to save this for the crew that's sick today, I guess. <laughs> Jeremiah remembered the pain. He remembered the bitterness. He remembered the poison of it all. But he didn't stop there. He didn't stay there. He reflected, and in reflecting, he considered not only the power of God, but even more importantly, he considered the goodness of God. Listen to what he's saying. I remember the pain, the suffering, even the poison. Gall. Now, that's a word we don't use very often anymore. I remember these things. I'll never forget these things. That, that was a horrible thing. But here's what else I remember. Verse 21, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. His compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The voice translation reads this way, gaining hope. I remember and wait for this thought. How enduring is God's loyal love. The eternal has inexhaustible compassion. Oh, beloved, I may remember the poison and the bitterness and the gall and the suffering and the sorrow, but I also know that God is faithful in the midst of it all. I also know that God is with me in the midst of it all. I also know that God is good. I don't face that alone. I don't face that alone. Intentionally, listen to me carefully. 
intentionally reflecting upon the goodness of God is the transcendent act of faith. You want to know what faith looks like? That's what it looks like. Faith isn't simply Peter stepping on the water. That's faith, don't get me wrong. But faith is also seeing life at its worst and saying God is still good. God is still good. God is still good. God is still good. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I can't figure it all out. I never know this side of eternity. But faith says God is good. And I'm going to reflect upon that. It is this transcendent act of faith that allows deep to touch deep. It is this transcendent act of faith that releases hope as our spirit rises above our circumstances and above our emotions. Jeremiah didn't deny how he felt. But how you feel isn't the final answer. If how you felt were the final answer, none of you go to work ever. (laughs) Amen? Can't be governed by that. You have to be governed by something deeper, something higher, something more cognitive, something more cognizant, but also something more spiritually deep. I'm going to be governed by the word of God. Faith says God is good, God is true, God is loving, God is kind. It is reflecting on the goodness of God that caused the psalmist to say in Psalm 42, why am I so overwrought? Why am I so disturbed? Why can't I just hope in God? Despite all my emotions, I will believe and praise the one who saves me and is my life. My God, my soul is so traumatized. The only help is remembering you. Wherever I may be. King David both personally and prophetically experienced this truth. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so, down, so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning. Yet you are holy. Enthroned on the praises of his people. You see, beloved. You and I must stop. Consider, look back, and say, there's where the Lord was. There's where the Lord was. Seven years ago, on a New Year's sermon, I shared with you a passage from from Joshua. You've not passed this way before. You've not passed this way before. And I shared with you my feeling that the next two years would determine the next 50. And that the Lord was going to take us down a path that we'd never been and was going to do some things that we'd never anticipated and, and never had, had, had experienced and, and in a lot of ways didn't want. That all came true. The Lord did do all those things. But not just with us, with me and my children. And not just with me and my children, but with many of your families. As we look back at the last five, six, seven years, we see a lifetime has happened. Changes in the campus, changes in the ministry, changes uh, around anticipation about the future. And there were times that were very dark, times that were very despairing, times in which Dr. Mantra and I would sit in the office, I'm not sure what's going to happen. And all we want is the Lord's will. And we would say it like that. I don't really know what to do, but I know I want the Lord's will. We'd call Reverend Fierce. We'd ask him for prayer and for fasting. Call the prayer team. Because you you know how it is, all right? Uh, The prayers of a righteous man avail much. So don't call Pastor Toby. Call Reverend Fierce, okay? Okay. <laughs> that's not that's not self-deprecation. That's fact. All right? But but so we would pray and we would we would seek, we would ask God. And now we get on this side of it and we look back. Now we still got a whole slew of problems around us. But nothing like that. 
And we stand here today and we look at that and we go, hold on. If God was faithful then, if God was faithful in that moment, if God was faithful in that hour, then he'll be faithful today too. Because this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The Lord is faithful. The Lord is good. The Lord is God. And the Lord is with us. Hallelujah. So reflection is an important thing. It's not important to live there. That's devastating to live there. It's silly to live there. You cannot live in the past, both good or bad. Because it doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist anymore. But you can look at the faithfulness of God as you meander down that road and that pathway. You say, God is good. God is faithful. Because the Lord has the power to speak the word of life. I think of the Syrophoenician woman. I think of, I think of the, of the, uh, of, of the, of the uh, faith of the centurion, of the Roman soldier who would look at Jesus and say, speak the word. Just speak the word. And my servant will be made whole. Just speak the word and my servant will be cured. Or the Syrophoenician woman who was, who was in, crying out after the Lord to heal her daughter, heal her daughter, heal her daughter. And the Lord had, 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 had ignored her. And, she's, and, and then when he finally did speak, he said, you know what? It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs and toss it to their puppies. And this woman, rather than being insulted, said, oh, but you know, Lord, even, even the puppies get the crumbs that fall off from the children's table. And the Lord looked at her and said, Woman, you have great faith. And what you want is done right now. Oh, beloved, there's a point in time where you push into the goodness of God, where you press into the favor of God, where you press into the mercy of God, where you call upon the mercy and the grace of God, no matter what the circumstances are. And you say, Lord, just speak the word and it'll be what I need. Oh, hallelujah. You see, a lot of things about getting older kind of stink. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I was, I'm not even going to go further there. We just know that's the truth. All right. But here's what doesn't stink. <laughs> You have more markers. Hallelujah. The things that would have disrupted me 25 years ago don't even don't even cross my filter today. Don't even think about them today. The things that would have made me stop and have to figure out for two months what to do don't even don't even come into two minutes today because I have more markers. I have more markers. I have more markers. I can look back and go, oh, Lord, you are faithful there. Oh, Lord, you are faithful here. Oh, Lord, you are faithful over there. Oh, Lord, you walked us through this and you walked us through that. And in our deepest, darkest time, you spoke life and hope and you brought victory and you brought peace. So I can face tomorrow because I know who was in my yesterdays that's the beauty of growing older you have a history of the markers of God so reflect on these things and recognize as Job said stop and consider God's wonders or as the psalmist said in Psalm 77 I will remember the deeds of the Lord yes I will remember your miracles of long ago I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds So reflect. In your notes, just write down two or three things that are markers for you. Two or three things that the Lord has done. Not not necessarily in 2017, but but just as you reflect on your yesterdays. Where was the Lord? How, How did the Lord do some things? How did the Lord bring about some things? Corporately, we have a couple miracles that we reflect upon. Multi-million dollar miracles. That's not small potatoes. Things that God has done. And so when we look at certain problems and certain situations, we go, well, you know, the Lord did that. So the only issue isn't whether or what or how. The only issue is, are we in his will? 
Are we in his will? If we're in his will, we'll be okay. And so that's where the, that's where the fight is then. Okay, Lord, you know, that's that, the thing I began this with. That's where you can either fall on the rock or it can fall on you. It's better to fall on it. It's better to fall on it. So, Lord, help me to be in your will. I, I, I choose to be broken. I choose that if I'm going the wrong way, arrest me. Arrest me. Because I know you're good. I know you're faithful. I know you're loving. I know you're kind. I know you're generous. I know that you're powerful. So that's not even the issue today. The issue is, am I in your will? Am I in your will? That's what reflection does. The second thing is this is a time for rejoicing. This is a time for celebration. This is a time to stand up and say, God is good. God is faithful. For the child of God, we do not rejoice in the same way or for the same things that the world does. The world gets happy if their team wins a game. I get happy too, but it doesn't last long. (laughs) Cowboys lost to the Seahawks a couple weeks ago. It was a horrible day for me. It lasted about 32 seconds. My oldest son, Joshua, he, he, he sent me a text. Can you believe this? And, you know, and, and, I, and we, don't, we often don't text each other during a game because of our schedules. We're never quite sure if, if one of them's watching the game live or not. You know, it might be a few minutes behind. So you don't want to go, what a great play. And I'm go, what play? I'm not there yet. You know? <laughs> Just, just word to the wise in the future, don't text me during a game, all right? Now, that aside, so, we, so at the end of the game, you know, I, the, the text always begins, did you watch the game? And I don't know why I'm doing this with my hand, but anyway, <laughs> did you watch the game? He goes, yeah, and he's mad and everything else. So then, he, then he starts on a, on a little rampage, which is off, uh, awesome, because jo- no, one, no one can delineate problems like, like Joshua can on meaningless things. I mean, he just went right down the... <laughs> And I laugh to myself because, I, I, you know, I can't, I can't blame him for that. He learned that from me. I mean, you know, that was one of those things that 25 years ago would have gotten to me. Still makes me mad. I'm bringing it up in a sermon, so obviously it makes me mad. But here's what I said to him. I said, yeah, all that's true. It doesn't change my life one iota. And I say that to you because I wonder how many things like that that are meaningless. Red light. Oh! Doesn't change your life one iota. President tweets something. Oh! So-and-so said this about me. Somebody said that about me. This happened, that happened. Oh, can you believe the price of gas? Well, that might change your life, but a little bit. (laughs) Think of how much energy is spent on wasteful things. Think of how much anger that should go at the devil is spent on your brother or your sister. Think of how much time is lost contemplating things that are not eternal. If anyone on the planet should be full of joy and full of hope and celebrate the new year and the new day and the new Sunday and the new Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. It is the people of God. Because your God is good and your God is faithful. And because of the Lord's great love, his compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. 
The Lord's unfailing love and mercy still continue, fresh as the morning, as sure as the sunrise. Oh, beloved, we don't need inebriation. We don't need shiny objects. We don't need confetti. We don't even need a million dollars. We got the Lord. Hallelujah. Have you ever watched how silly people act when they meet somebody that's a celebrity? This is part of getting older. I think about stuff like this. You ever notice how, how, how people act? Okay, if, if, if one of the warriors came into church today, you'd say, there you go. You guys would pretend that I wasn't here. You'd all be crowding around him. You'd be sitting next to him. You'd be, you'd be kind of rubbing up to him. Yeah, you know, and, and then you'd be getting out your cameras and doing all this weird stuff, you know. Yeah, I couldn't even go to church. Don't shake your head. You know it's the truth. Okay? Movie star. We do all sorts of things like that. And we, we try to ingratiate ourselves to them. And then we want to tell our buddies at work, yeah, you know. So and so is at so and so is at church, and and uh, you know I sat right next to him, or I sat right behind him. All right, you know. you know, I've done the same thing. I went to Jack's church one time, Jack Hayford's church. Ron and I, we sat in the balcony. We sat right behind Pat Boone. You know, some of you don't know who Pat Boone is, but you know, <laughs> he's even older than me. But okay. Oh, I didn't take a picture with him because I didn't have that kind of phone in those days. You know. But, but Hayford always had these prayer circles. So I was in a prayer circle with Pat Boone. Pat Boone prayed for me. Was it more special or more holy than Reverend Fears? Not at all. <laughs> but there's still a little part of me that goes, look at that white-shoed old man, you know? <laughs> I met Pat Boone, and then you, you meet somebody else, and you talk about it, and you, and you got a little autograph book. Why do, you, why do you get an autograph? So you can prove to your friends that you actually met that person. And then now it's a monetary market thing. Well, I want to make some money, and then you got the, the photos and everything. Have you ever thought how silly people act when they meet somebody that they deem important? It's the truth, isn't it? Well, hold on a second. Kevin Durant may never call you his friend. And Steph Curry may never know you if you walk by. Okay? And you may not know who Pat Boone is, so it doesn't matter if he doesn't know who you are. But there is somebody who knows you. There is someone who knows your name. There is someone who's willing to call you his friend. And he's not a celebrity by the world standards. He's king of all kings. He's the Lord of all lords. He's the God of all gods. He's the most high and lifted up. And his love is unfailing. And his mercy continues. And never will he leave you. And never will he forsake you. And never will he abandon you. You are the Lord's and he is yours. Gain some perspective. Start rejoicing a little bit. Start celebrating a little bit. Start honoring him a little bit more. You have access to the Most High. You can call on him day or night. You can call on him right here, right now, 24 hours from now, in the middle of your darkness, in the middle of your delight. You can call on him, and whosoever will call on the name of the Lord not only will be saved, but before you call, he'll answer, here I am. You and I should be the ones rejoicing because God himself has said in Hebrews 13, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down, nor relax my hold upon you. Assuredly not. 
We rejoice because the Lord your God has arrived to live among you. He's a mighty Savior. He will give you victory. He will rejoice over you in great gladness. He will love you and not accuse you. Is that a joyous choir I hear? No, it is the Lord himself exulting over you. I'm pretty sure KD is not singing a song about you. I'm pretty sure the celebrity, the Facebook kid, the president, the former presidents, pretty sure they're not singing a song over you. Pretty sure the movie star you like to see in the movies isn't singing a song about you. Pretty sure none of them are calling you friend. But Jesus is. He's written a song about you. He's singing a song about you. You should rejoice. Once you have intentionally reflected upon the goodness of the Lord, the natural response of our spirit is then to rejoice in the Lord. Not as an emotional opiate, nor as some psychological sedative, but because transcendent faith, which again, to reflect even in negative circumstances and find the goodness of the Lord is transcendent faith. Transcendent faith leads to transcendent worship. It is the natural outgrowth of that choice, that decision, that belief system. I will worship him. I will praise him. I will glorify him. That's why Paul, from a prison cell, would tell the Philippian believers, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. This is why heaven declares in Revelation chapter 4, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created. Hallelujah. That's why the psalmist say, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. Hallelujah. The time of reflecting. It's a time of rejoicing. And we're out of time, but the last point is it's a time of renewing. It's a time for renewing. Twenty eighteen will mark the beginning of the thirty seventh year of pastoral ministry for me. My twelfth year here, a lifetime ago. Corporately, 2018 will mark the 74th year of our ministry in Oakland, of the Patent Community of Faith. Seven decades since a powerful revival began this work. Even in the building in which we worship, 2018 will mark the 54th year of the cathedral. Through faith, sacrifice, and sheer determination, Worship, preaching, and the ministry through this facility and on this campus has been serving the Fruitvale community for half a century. Reflect on these things. Rejoice in them. But if that's all you do, then they're nothing more than monuments to our yesterdays. And God wants them to be bridges to our tomorrows. Reflection and rejoicing must lead to renewing. Not just a look what God did, but look what he's doing and going to do. Look at this verse in the Amplified Bible of our text. This I recall, and therefore have I hope 
and expectation. Say that word with me, expectation. It is because of the Lord's mercy and loving kindness that we're not consumed because his tender compassions fell not. They're new every morning. Great and abundant is your stability and faithfulness. The reason for hope The reason for our rejoicing is the expectation of promise and renewal. When a mother is with child, we will often refer to her as expecting. And and she's expecting because there's an implied hope and there's an implied promise when we see a woman in that beautiful condition. We instinctively look for the best of the circumstance, the promise of life, the promise of possibility, the promise of renewal. Whenever I dedicate a child, my mind can't help but think of what the Lord has for this child. Maybe this is the child that grows up to be the president of presidents. Maybe this is the child that finds the cure to terrible diseases like cancer and other things. Maybe this is the child that takes the gospel to places that haven't been reached yet. There's so much expectation. There's so much life. There's so much vigor. There's so much vitality. There's so much hope in each individual life. So much possibility of what God wants to do. The promise of life, the promise of renewal, the promise of of possibility. In the most fundamental sense, every child that is born is a renewing of humanity. It is a continuing of life. It is continuing of culture and values and belief system of the forebears. But also, most literally, every child that is born is renewing the species. It is God's way of saying, I'm not done with humanity. So even in the psalmist 139, even the darkness isn't dark to you. Night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious concerning me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Oh, beloved, before you were formed in your mother's womb, the Lord had your days ordained. How can you not face 2018, the year of the Lord, without expectation? God ordained you to be here this day. God chose you to be here in this hour. God chose us to be serving him in this season, in this moment, in this time. You could have been brought or or could have been birthed any other time. God chose you in this time. God determined this hour. God determined that we would be in the United States. God determined that we would be, that there would be a United States. God determined that we would be here in the Bay Area in this time, in this season. I know the enemy's raging. I know hell is mocking. I know the kingdom of darkness is trying to uh, assert itself. But beloved, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I can face tomorrow with expectation and with hope because the Lord reigns. Don't shrink back. Stop and consider what he's done. Remind yourself how faithful he's been and how faithful he'll be. Rejoice because you're a child of God. You're a child of the Most High. There's nothing that is formed against you that can prosper because the Lord, your God, is with you. And then face tomorrow, your tomorrow and our tomorrow. With earnest expectation. The Lord has great things. The Lord has great things. The Lord has great things for you. Again, our text. It is the God who sees the... uh, God is the God who sees the hope in the darkness and light in unseen places. Even when we're unaware of life, God is knitting things together. And in Lamentations 3, he says, I have hope. 
I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. Again, the famous verse in Jeremiah 29, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Paul told Timothy from his prison cell, the prison cell in which he would die. I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. So, beloved, let us intentionally reflect upon the goodness of the Lord and his faithfulness. Let us intentionally rejoice in his grace. And let us intentionally renew our hope in his capacity to fulfill his purpose and promise in our lives, our families, our church, and our community. Let us commit ourselves to the renewal of grace and a revival of his love in our church. And in our city, I'm asking that you pray every day for the Lord to bring revival. Revival. You will receive power, Jesus said in Acts 1. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God, the salvation for everyone who believes. Beloved, I'm not interested in making God your servant or my servant. I'm not interested in making a gospel message that acts like God, that that God's lucky to have you. That's not the gospel. The gospel is that I'm a wretched sinner in need of a Savior. I'm not sort of good. I'm not sort of going to heaven. I'm not sort of going to hell. No, I'm, I'm lost. And I am rightfully damned to hell without him. But he loves me so much that he sent his only begotten son that if I would believe in him, I'll not perish, but have everlasting life. You and I have a king. Hallelujah. And he's not our servant. We're his. And we can look back and say he's been good because he is good. We can look in the now and we can rejoice because he is worthy to rejoice in because he's good. And he loves you and he loves me. And we can anticipate the future and bring the gospel message to a lost and dying world because the Lord loves them. Let us pray for revival. Let us pray for revival. Let us pray for revival. We have the privilege this morning, the first Sunday of the new year, of going to the Lord's table in Holy Communion. It's a table of these three things. We reflect on what the Lord's done. We remember Him. We rejoice in the salvation that has been given to us, a new covenant written in His blood. And we anticipate His return. You show forth the Lord's death until he comes again. This table is a marker. This table is a Sabbath. This table is a moment. So I want to pray with you before we go to the Lord's table. And then I'll ask the communion team and the worship team to come. Let me pray with all of you first, okay? Every head bowed just for a moment. If you would say, Pastor, please pray with me that I would intentionally reflect on the goodness of God in my yesterdays. I've been looking at yesterday, but I haven't been bringing the goodness of God into it. And I see that bitterness and cynicism and woundedness is, is, is overwhelming me from yesterday. And I want, to, I want to bring with intentionality God's grace back into my recollection. With every head bowed, if that's where you are, would you just slip, slip, slip up your hand for just a moment. God bless you, dear ones. God bless you all. You can put your hands down. Father, in the name of Jesus, with intentionality, we fall on the rock today. 
with intentionality, we look on those broken places in our lives, those charred remains, the places of devastation. And Lord, as we've looked upon them, we've been broken, we've been wounded, we've been hurt, but we've also kind of grown cynical and bitter. The woundedness stays wounding, and that's not your will. So in the name of Jesus, with intentionality, we look and we find your grace. We find your mercy. We're not there anymore. We're not there anymore. We're not there anymore. Hallelujah. You met us. You picked us up. You dusted us off. When we couldn't walk, you carried us. When we couldn't talk, you prayed for us. When we couldn't sing, you sang over us. When we couldn't do anything, Lord God, you just sat down with us and never left us and never forsook us. And Lord, help them, my beloved friends, to see your faithfulness. And let the bitterness just fall. Oh, Lord, let it just fall. Hallelujah. Let it just fall off of that. Oh, hallelujah. Lord God, like, a, like an old, ugly garment, let, let it just fall off of them and clothe them with the garments of praise today. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, put a new song in their mouth. Put a new bounce in their step. Put a new hope in their spirit. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let praise fill their heart as they rejoice in your goodness. And now, Lord, turn their gaze toward the promise of tomorrow. Turn their gaze toward the promise of what you are going to do and what you want to do and what you're willing to do. And so, Lord, I pray for every one of us in this room. I pray for the grace to be broken so the cataclysm doesn't have to crush. I pray for the grace to be broken that we can look at our tomorrows with brokenness and humility and say, Lord, only you Only you, only you can enable us. Only you can equip us. Only you can provide for us. Only you can heal us. Only you can strengthen us. Only you can give us hope and joy and peace. Only you can give us love for our enemies. Only you can give us love for those who would wrongfully use us and speak ill of us. Only you, Lord God. So with humility, we come before you and say, Father, have your will. Have your way in each of us and corporately in us. And we thank you for this grace in Jesus' sacred, sacred, sacred name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're in this house and you don't know Christ as Savior, but you wish to surrender your life to him today, would you please raise your hand and I'll pray with you where you are. God bless you, sister. In the name of the Lord. Is there anyone else who said, I don't know the Lord, but I want to surrender my life to him? Hallelujah. 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 Church, would you please pray this with me? And my sister who raised your hand, make this prayer your prayer. And then following the service, if you'd let me have a word of prayer with you, I'd appreciate that. Church, let us pray. Heavenly Father, In the name of Jesus, I surrender my life to the Lordship, to the mastery, to the control of Jesus Christ, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the one who died on the cross and the one who rose from the grave, the only Savior the only Redeemer. I give you, Lord, all of me. Please rule. Please reign. Please forgive me of 
of all my sins. And I thank you for the promise and the hope of eternity and of tomorrow. It all resides in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Church, please prepare your hearts to go to the Lord's table. Worship team, community team. If you would please serve the congregation now.